first of all, a warm welcome to you all uh, this afternoon. It's such a joy to see you, each and every one of you gathered here, and a special welcome, obviously, uh, for the folk from the Heath uh, Evangelical Church, uh, Cardiff. Now, there will be others joining us uh, for the next session. I'm so glad that Wynne's going to come uh, for our second session. I know there'll be a number uh, from the area which will be coming uh, for that. This is really an introduction uh, session, and uh, but a warm welcome to a number from, uh, well, Jeremy, good to see you. David's coming up the uh, pathway now from Cautious and Church. And also uh, for Pat and uh, Colin, great to see you once again. And Vince's family. I know Vince is not going to like this, but he's the one who's actually done the windbreak for us. And our sign is mended outside. <laughs> and we're glad for that. And uh, we do appreciate it. Oh, and there's Martin. Well, look, you've come for this session too. Well, good to see you, Martin. And uh, Kay. Well, uh, as I was uh, saying, that um, we've got a number of, of speakers for us then. The next session will be win, and then um, tomorrow we've got Adrian Vaughan for uh, two. Martin's going to be in the afternoon uh, for us uh, for this occasion. Now, it is our real privilege as a church uh, that we are holding this, this event, uh, Revival. I know it's a big thing uh, for you there in the Heath. I'm glad for that, that someone hasn't lost the vision and that uh, we do need in these days uh, revival. Look, so everything for this weekend for you is uh, being provided. Everything. We're just so glad for your fellowship over the years. You've given so much to us. The only thing that you're going to need money for is the Indian tonight, <laughs> which is uh, down the bottom end of town. You actually need cash for that. They don't take anything else, so let me know uh, for, for that. They work differently here. It, it, it does make me very nervous. Uh, I, I went down there, I booked it in, and he's working on last year's diary. He's got last year's diary. And I said, look, the days are different, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter. That's how he does it. Uh, so, but he knows how to do it, uh, and he can, he, he can use it. So that's at, that's at, f uh, five, um, that's at uh, five o'clock. But uh, for everything else, it'd be our privilege to entertain uh, you, the saints, uh, for this weekend. Um, also, let me just uh, mention, yes, for this occasion, just to say to you, we have got something special for you uh, that you were coming and I want you to take it home. There's a number of uh, free gifts that you do have. You know, they got the conferences, they give you these little bags now and they, they do that. Well, what we've got for you, we've got for everyone uh, just a little booklet or uh, Wales Revival Conference, Bethesda, just take it. It's um, just the introduction I'm going to give to you, but in a fuller form uh, this afternoon. Take that, uh, have a read of it. There is only one mistake in it. It's not, it's not they're, they're given away. They're not uh, going to be used uh, in any other format. So uh, take that. Take that book. Every one of you has one of those. Also we have, because I do know this weekend, You've got a number of prayer times uh, scheduled in. Now, some of you from the Heath will have one of these little booklets, an encouragement for prayer. If you haven't got this booklet, this booklet will be given to you also. It's, uh, it's just read it. Um, because if you are on this revival conference, we do need to pray uh, for God's blessing. That's another little gift, Lord, which is given for you. And then, thirdly... I've got these three copies, I'm afraid. We've got other copies downstairs of another book, which is not the one I ordered. And uh, here it is, and it's The Calvary Road by Roy Hessian. And you say, well, look, if you've never read the book, uh, then take it, it's free. These are for you today. And uh, if you have got the book, then go home and read it. I was reading a, a historical uh, publication just a number of weeks ago, uh, the diffusion of evangelicalism the last uh, 70 years and it was a scholarly work but it actually mentioned this book and the use of it in uh, North Africa and down the coast and how it's been used in uh, reviving a personal revival and also the revival of uh, you know communities so please uh, take yourself these these books everyone revival book if you don't possess this take it and also 
is copies of the Calvary Road. I have got a book downstairs for, um, we've got it from the Heath, but it was called My Calvary Road. <laughs> it was slightly different, but it's uh, Roy Helsing's uh, testimony. Those will be free too. Also for you uh, to take home is uh, there's a number of free literature downstairs. You'll see it. Uh, we've got various books, free literature. Take a look through that and you can take any book that you wish at, uh, 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 for this weekend. Now, as I said, we've got this revival uh, weekend, and I don't know what what part you know uh, this is going to play. I uh, hope uh, it will kindle something in our uh, in our own lives, and uh, also once again in the life of a need that we have uh, for a nation. I do want to mention uh, Carrie and Rose because I do know that they held these uh, revival conferences in Wales uh, before COVID, before COVID. And um, it's really strange. We're living in Wales and we are perhaps the only country, you know they have it in England, they have it in various parts of it, that we don't hold perhaps, you know, uh, such a, uh, an occasion as this where we want to think again of what God has done uh, to us and for us as a nation. There is a place, I'm going to speak about it this afternoon, just, just the thought of, of what these conferences are supposed to be about and uh, the need of them and perhaps that God would bless them. That's in that little booklet. Look, uh, we're here. God wants to do something with us. I don't want us to waste time You'll find that in the address. I want to make the most of it. Now, what I'm going to do, just Alistair, if you come forward, and then after you, I'm going to pray and read, and then we'll sing a hymn, and we'll go straight into our, our address. Thanks, Chris. I'm not sure there's much more for me to say, really, um, other, other than to thank Chris and Beth. Um, Beth's there somewhere, isn't she? Yeah, the sorry. church. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, and, the, and, the, and the fellowship here at, uh, at Narbeth for, uh, for wel welcoming us uh, so uh, wonderfully uh, downstairs um, when we um, uh, enjoyed the, the, the refreshments and the, and the fellowship. And if, if the way that it's began is, is the way that it continues, then that's especially as far as I'm concerned. It's a wonderful thing. I'm sure it will. Thank you for that, um, Chris. Um, and so you've produced a book. Yes, a yes, course. for everyone that, here. That, that is quite something. I, I'm, not aware, I, I'm not aware of this. We've actually, we've actually got a conference book there. Because this started, the, um, the idea for this started when um, Beth and Sarah and I and others were, were, were cooking on a kids' camp in the summer down in, um, in Devon. And, um, and we were sat around the table, the cook's table, and Chris joins us there because he thinks he'll get more food that way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we got talking, and, um, and, and um, it was actually a previous conversation with Wynne with Win Hughes that he and I had had, and we, when we discussed the fact that it was, that was the um, uh, anniversary of the 1904-1905 of the revival this year, 120th anniversary. And there's, uh, as, as Chris mentioned, there's, in, in our church, there's, there's always been this sort of theme of revival, and um, it, it's something certainly when it when it when it comes up, and when I remember, and when I read about it, it stirs something in me. So I was keen for um, for us to uh, do something about the um, about the anniversary of the revival, and perhaps that, as Chris was mentioning, it would it would kindle something mm. in, in 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 our hearts. So. Thank you. Chris is keen for me to stop, so I will, I will stop, but I'll just check if there's anything I'm supposed to have said. I think you've said about the end of meal, haven't I? Is there anything else said? Refreshments downstairs That's right. after, after this, and there's cakes and things. Yeah, everything's there. There's plenty there, I assure you. Really yeah, indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Good to see you. Are you right there? That's right. So we got this till three o'clock, there's refreshments. Um, yeah, I got that right. No, half past three. And then, then winds come in, and that's winds coming to speak. Let's commit everything we do to the Lord. Let's bow our heads and let us pray.
We come before you this day, most gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we're thankful that you are the triune God and that you have a great purpose in this world that for the likes of people as us may come and know you and know you, Lord, in a living, true and real way that we would acknowledge you, that we would sing forth your praises, that we would know of your great salvation. And we do ask you especially for all that Jesus Christ has done for us, that you would make him known to us even this very moment, that we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would, Father, as we have drawn aside, even for these meetings, for this occasion, for, Lord, the day in which we live, Father, for the hour in which we minister, that we would be those who would come to seek your face, to ask your blessing, to know once again that what we undertake would be, Father, undertaken by you, that it would not only be in word only, but with much power and of the Holy Spirit and with assurance. And we ask you this very moment that all that take place, Father, everyone who speaks, uh, Wynne and Adrian and Martin, that they would know also, Father, that this would come and kindle a flame in, in, in a heart of each and every one, that we will truly love you more, that we, Father, would desire you more, and that most of all, that your name would be honoured in this very day. Hear our cry, give us praise to pray, open our mouth big, that we, Father, should know once again of the wondrous works of God, even, Father, in our generation, for the salvation of many souls souls we ask in Jesus name amen just one short reading uh, just shows that when you're organizing a booklet always be led it's not the reading in the book it's one it's one two six uh, short reading and uh, Psalm 126 when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion we were like those who dream then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. We'll sing a well-known hymn of uh, the revival, which is number 242, 242 in your hymn books, uh, translated by uh, William... Edwards, who was actually I'm going to mention it later, principal of the South Wales Baptist College, but man who was for the the, the great work of God, and uh, here is uh, became the theme tune, did it not? Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life are ransomed, shed for us his precious blood. We'll stand to sing two four two.
Well, if you have your Bible, simply put one in your hand and perhaps we'll turn to a text uh, here and there as we go forth. Now, I just want to speak, first of all, about a revival conference. Uh, when we were asked to uh, host a revival conference, there are a number of things that came to mind. It was very challenging, very challenging. Challenging to myself, challenging to the church, not just practically, but spiritually. You know, how serious are we about the things of revival? How have we prayed for it? Do we really long for it? Those are the questions that really came to one's mind. And uh, is there a place for a revival conference? Uh, is there a need for it? And uh, what can we expect from being in such a, a meeting and gathering over the weekend? Now, I must tell you, I am not in any uh, place to waste your time. And uh, I don't want to simply go through the motions. I do know this, is that uh, we have as a church, for example, 100 years ago, sorry, uh, 20 years ago, we remembered the 1904 uh, revival. Uh, we did it in the area. We actually held some meetings, but it wasn't without opposition from various quarters of the church in the local area. Uh, we have, as a church, uh, genuinely tried to encourage people to read about you know, such events and to bring it before uh, the attention. We have also have a great understanding in our heart, such is the desperate state we're in at the moment in our land, spiritually speaking, uh, such are the days in which we live where places like this are empty, and uh, these places, although not good enough perhaps for the worship of God, are good enough for the worship of every other religion as they buy them up, and you begin to see a great change and we've come to a place, and perhaps you've come to a place, that the only thing, knowing the fact that we're unable to reach such sections in the community where there are great needs and ungodliness and other religions, the only hope we've got is that God would do a great work once again where there would be a, a tide and a flow which will stem and come and bless many, many uh, places of our land. It has been, I will show you, a prayer within our uh, prayer meeting. We constantly pray uh, for revival. Well, the Holy Spirit is our number one uh, request every single week. And uh, there is a need. We do have uh, some longing, but I just hoped this weekend, that uh, this is not just something that will be of interest, that it will be actually a longing within our hearts and within our experience. And what we have is, as we begin, I want to say to you, we begin with a kind of uh, trepidation. I do do that uh, because of what we're about. Let me explain to you. We are speaking today about the things of God, the real workings of God, and we have a longing for God to move amongst us, and God is a consuming fire. And when you're thinking of revival, you're thinking of the fact of when God comes down with a holy fire which is able to purify and able to cleanse, and, and to be honest with you, I'm just putting it down to begin with. It's simply this. Fire is not to be played with. And when we come and we talk about revival, and we deal with what God is able to do, and to say that we want revival, you play with fire, and you'll be burnt. And you'll be burnt. And when we think about such a weekend, I don't want to spoil it to begin with, but it goes like this, that there are many which have been burnt. And you see, fire can warm you. Fire can burn you and scorch you. And you know, I've known of congregations and I've known of uh, uh, people who have taken this kind of subject 
And you know, they, they, those churches no longer uh, exist. Uh, I don't know if they've burned out. I don't know what happened. But it's been something where they've been sincere, they've been true, but uh, this is not to be played with. And uh, we need to be careful. Although I want to tell you, there is a place for such a gathering this weekend. And the reason for it is this, is that we need once again to hear once more of the great things that God has done. I'll just give you one verse, for example, to turn to, just to, to, to launch off in some way, um, to know of the wonderful works which God has done. And just simply that verse from Psalm 44 and verse 1. I want you to think about it. This is what it says. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in the days of old. Uh, simply that. Uh, we have uh, heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in the days of old. Now, the problem we've got today is this, is that people have not even heard of those deeds. It's true that pros, every one of us in this place may be an orphan to the experience of revival, but we've come to a day in our lives where we're even orphans to hearing about the deeds of revival, even amongst us. And yet, when God comes and does and quickens a work in a desperate situation where we find ourselves in, I know what people say, go to those revival conferences, you're always speaking of the past, and the problem with you lot is that you're living in the past, except for this, that God has something that he wants us to know about the past to quicken us in the present for the blessing of the future. I'll give you this kind of verse. You can turn to it. It's found in the book of Judges and is in chapter 6. And you know the total utter uh, uh, devastation that was taking place amongst the people of God. Midian had come in, swamped the land. Their harvests could not be dealt with. They were in a desperate state. And then you find this in verse 7 of Judges chapter 6. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, they began to cry to God. And you know what God did? This is what he did. And the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel. I brought you up from Egypt and I brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And when they began to cry to God, God came and answered them. And you know what he did? He didn't come with a message and say, now think, you're a good people. You can do this if you just pulled your socks up, if you just tried a bit harder, if you just went out there and did something. The first thing God did was this. He sends a prophet to tell them what God had done in the past. Remember that. They needed to know once again that God had worked mightily amongst them. God had dealt with them. God had delivered them. God had driven these nations out in the past. And when it comes to a conference such as this, you desperately need to know what God has done. Those wondrous works of God because that will inspire you. That will put faith in you. That will make your mouth big to pray to God that he can do these things once again. And it's his way. It's the way of what he has done. 
And it's uh, not how great we are. It's not what we're able to do, but what God has done. Now, look, there, we're living in a time. I just want to make this uh, to you. Sin has taken us away from the experience of God's blessing. The devil has taken us away from even the knowledge of what God has done. And when we read these very words, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us, the deeds you did in the days of old, I can assure you now, there's a church living in Wales who have no idea of the incredible outpourings this nation has faced. And the devil hates that. And I'll tell you why the devil hates that. Because he, the last thing he wants people to know is what God is able to do and the power that God has and the wonderful works of God when he has driven the chariot of the gospel through this land for 1,700 years and that word of salvation and the forgiveness of sins and of the power of Jesus Christ and the victory from the dead and the wonderful forgiveness of eternal life we can have with him People, do you see, that very knowledge has been placed from God has worked in a way with his word and with his spirit and with power and has come with much assurance. And uh, people need to know that. Do you know, there have been times, time and time and time again that uh, this has actually uh, taken place. And uh, don't take it for granted. I'm just going to quote you something here, and this is what it says. A quote from Karl Marx. If you can get a people to forget their heritage and background, you can get them to do almost anything. Well, there's one for the church, isn't it? If you could forget them, get them to forget what God has done in the past of their heritage and their background, perhaps that's the reason we're actually in such a mess today. The ideas people have got, madness, the madness of it, for church growth, for the salvation of souls, for the need of the nation. That's why people, even in church today, call fun days instead of prayer days. And you say, what's it about? Because we're trying to stem the tide of the darkness crouching near, of the ungodliness in our society, the apostasy which we're in. And we've forgotten what God has done in the past. And uh, if ever there was uh, a need for us to hear these things once again, is for us here in this nation of Wales. And I'll tell you why, because we are a people which God has abundantly blessed. Although we may be a few, he has, he has, he has blessed this nation like none other with mighty outpourings of his Holy Spirit. Now, I know Werner Hayam came a number of years ago down to this area. He actually came and he spoke in uh, the Beth Martin's church down in Bethesda Road. And he actually said at that time that he had over 200 accounts of various outpourings of God on this nation. Uh, he had uh, collected these uh, records of God working, as we know, in our land, he hasn't just uh, uh, swept through a nation once, not swept through a nation twice. He swept through a nation time and time again. And he has swept through communities on various occasions. He has swept through churches at various times. He said he had 200 accounts of, of such uh, happenings. Do you know, when I thought of that, do you know what I thought in my head? That's not the half. That's not the half of it. 
And you say, how do you know it's not the half of it? Because of this. That's only 200 which has been correlated and collected. Let me tell you a story uh, just to share with you. Many, many years ago, I was in a hospital ward. Uh, in my teenagers then, I think, yes, I was. I'd, uh, I'd been uh, just converted. And I was in this ward and um, there was a man diagonally opposite me who was from Flampimsaint. The man was not a Christian. He had uh, made sure that we knew in our little four-bedroom uh, ward that uh, he knew he wasn't a Christian. I had just literally become a Christian. And I had never heard of such a thing as revival. And this man then was talking, as I said, there was a Christian, told me of the account when God actually, I think it was this very man who came to the village in the 30s in that account and told me now he was in his 80s and he was telling me of what happened there and what people experienced and the things that took place and how people were changed. He himself wasn't, but he testified to it. A God had worked remarkably at a time, in a place, in a village, such as that, and recorded plenty of it. We have heard with our ears, thankfully we have, what our fathers have told us, the great deeds that you did in the days of old. And let me just make this uh, point, because in Wales we've got a rich spiritual heritage like none other. Let me describe it to you. If you go to the land of England, uh, they have, uh, they know, know if you go, it, it, you know, you don't realise how culturally different it is, how spiritually different it is. And if you were to go to the, to the land of England, and it's interesting, when one ministers today, uh, I go up and the further you go west, sometimes it's uh, spiritually better in Swansea and Cardiff and you cross the borders. I'm not saying it's great. Uh, but they've known of uh, a spiritual blessing. But if I paint with a broad brush, that spiritual blessing has been of an Anglican kind of flavour. It has been with shadows and rituals. People have been converted, no doubt about it. God has worked in those very means. But it's not been our experience. God's worked differently in this land. He's worked in more powerful ways. And God has worked in that land. He has worked with a gentle breeze. But when it comes to Wales, the history is this. He has blown through it at various times. He has used the preaching of God's word. There's been mighty preaching of God's word. It's been different. That's been our heritage. Take again, take of what you think of Scotland. Take that land, a land which has been where truths of Christianity established. Great theologians, great denominations. Do you know, even a land which is known as you know today. Revivals in various parts, the Isle of Lewis revival and other places. That's true. But it's not known as the land of revival. Your, this, this land is known as the land of revival. You say, why is that? Because we've got a heritage. We've heard with our ears what God has done in the things then of the past. And let me just tell you something else. Germany. I, I know you may find this incredible, but let me tell you something about Germany even today. You go and you go to a uh, a convention, which will be something like our Aberystwyth Convention. And uh, what will happen is this, that they will have about 15,000 people which will turn up for a lecture. A lecture on a th theology. 15,000. They could fill just an auditorium for someone to give them their Germans. They like lectures. They, that, that's their kind of background. 
That's what they are. Well, God can use their lectures. But it's never been lectures in Wales. It's been something else. We've had and known the preaching and the understanding of, of God's word, which has come powerfully in this land. Let me tell you about Wales. I, I, just the reason for this conference. Because something's happened in the psyche of us as Christians where we become embarrassed with our past that we should be such a revival people. Now, if it hasn't dawned upon you, if it hasn't, you know, if you missed it, there are people who come to Wales on some kind of spiritual pilgrimage from all over the world. You go to Lacha, where uh, Evan Roberts and his home church, it's open weekly, go through the visitor's book. They come from Korea. They come from Africa. They come from India. You know, people, as we know in this land, they come from Madagascar. We went to a church. They come all over the world back to trace their roots to this land of Wales and many other people. But when we come to Wales, we're ashamed of it. We are. Uh, we, we've got uh, a place in our lives where we have, uh, we think that our past is a hindrance to the future. We're thinking in our minds today that uh, because we are looking to the past, and just bringing that text to you, I can bring uh, many more we're going to look at now, where there's a problem we've got is because we're no longer understanding what God has done in the past that um, we, we're trying things and we're doing things uh, which is out what, what we have not known has been in our past. Now, look, I'm going to just share with you. Uh, well, if it gets in trouble, it gets in trouble. Like I said, it's not here. We're not here, are we? Just to have a nice little time. We want to know. Now, I've been 30 years in ministry, and uh, I, I'll just put it like this. I would have gone, and I used to go to a minister's conference. I would go every single year to a particular conference. You couldn't pull me from that conference. One year, do you know what I had to do? I had to change my wedding day to go to that conference. I had to make it a week later. You know, to go to that conference, right? And you say, well, well what about that? I'll tell you what I, I just loved about that conference. There may be others who didn't love it. Is that every single evening, there would be a discussion and it would come round to revival. No matter how it began, it always finished and always taken up with revival. I loved that conference. Because those men love revival. They spoke about revival. They longed for revival. They wanted revival. It was revival. And all of a sudden things began to change. And the last thing on the agenda, I assure you this, was revival. You say something happened in a generation. And so much so, not only have we now become orphans to the experience We've become orphans to the very knowledge of what God has really done in the past. And he has done great and he has done mighty things uh, with us and through us. I'll just give you another verse. I've got it here. It's Psalm 78 and it's verse 7. Turn to it. It's just a few little verses. That's all it is. And you, if you had your Bible, you will go through this theme and you'll think to yourself well, what God is uh, placing before us. And this is what it says. Remember now, this is just to challenge the objectors to such meetings, uh, that uh, the problem with you is the past. This is what it says. Psalm 78, verse 7. That they may set their hope in God and not forget 
the works of God. Hold on to it in verse 42 of Psalm 78. They did not remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy. And what I'm going to say to you of the need of such a meeting as this is that, uh, look, we want the power. We want the experience. But I just need us to just think for a moment that there is a place that we need to speak about what God has done so that we could open our mouths wide and we could hope for what God can do once again. Just going to give you just a few examples of how this was once spoken. We had a hymn and uh, the hymn was uh, translated by a man called uh, Principal Edwards. Principal Edwards. He was the principal of South Wales Baptist College. But he was a revival man. He loved the revival. And he had students which were for the revival. Let me take you 60 years forward. There was another man who was principal of South Wales Baptist College. And his name was Ethel Jones. You may have heard, some of you may not have heard. Ethel Jones was an evangelical with a small e. But you may know who his uncle was. His uncle was R.B. Jones. And I heard this because this is what he said. It was uh, given to me by someone you may know, Albert Williams who was in a college at the time when Ethel Jones was then the principal. He said, you know, when we were in college uh, in Cardiff, not known for being a bastion of evangelicalism, he said, you know, the conversation amongst the students was revival. It was always revival. And he said that whatever we spoke about revival, there was not anything you could tell Ethel Jones about revival. Because Ethel Jones had told them this, you can say whatever you want. I grew up around the hearth. Night after night, our talk was revival. And he said, whatever we said, Ethel Jones knew about it. I'm just saying we no longer know of such things and because we don't know of such things we don't even know what we're praying for we're not even knowing what we're looking for we're not even knowing what we want i'll give you another example in a book hope this is not destroying your conference to begin with in the great uh, preachers of wales there is a little account, not only of great preaching, but of the congregation. And the congregation, it said, would wait for the moment when the preacher knew of the unction which was upon his preaching. You see, they went to a place of worship and they went and they listened to the preaching of God's word, but they were also listening for something more. They wanted something more. And it says that they could almost tell when it happened, when there was the powering and the unction which fell upon the preaching of God's word. I tell you what you have today. People are happy if they just have sound teaching. Good illustrations. You want your lovely three points. <laughs> you want to feel, feel. And people are happy with it. People are content. And these people went and they were looking for something more. Do you know, we, we don't know these things. I'll give you another little illustration just to 
to go on to my next point. We may not have experienced such things, but a number of years ago, I was in a little meeting, and I say little, there were about six people in the congregation. That's no problem with God, no problem. And on this particular afternoon Sunday service, um, which I had taken on many occasions, all of a sudden, in the pulpit, I'm finding a wonderful freedom and liberty. I'm saying things which I know that somehow I'm not even thinking what on earth and I am enjoying myself in one sense and I know that wow this is something where I am I'm standing and I don't know how to put it there were six people there and uh, I walk down from the pulpit and one of the people in the pew came to me and said what religion are you what religion are you I said, what do you mean, what religion? I'm your Baptist minister. I've been here. Yes. Yeah, I know. But what religion are you? Because something else can come upon a meeting. And even though they can't understand or know, they know there's something more than just the usual service they've had. And uh, we may be orphans to, to, the, to the real thing. But uh, we don't know of that experience. Look, I'm just saying there is a challenge to us for a conference. I'm saying to you there's a need for such things that we would hear with our years once again, what our fathers have done in the past. And then I'm going to give you this warning. And it's a real warning. And I want you to consider it for a moment. Because uh, if God were to come, I want us to know what we're praying for. I want us to know what we're longing for. I want us to know uh, that we don't uh, come to a place because this can do us harm. Look, revival for some people is not a blessing. Jonathan Edwards, who saw two revivals in his work on uh, religious affections, he speaks and he tells us of there were those who experienced various things, but somehow, instead of becoming humbled by God's word, were filled with a pride. And so much so that they came to a place that they were almost unteachable and unleading, in, uh, impossible to lead. Now, I will warn you of that. It's good to be here. That even if you just know a little bit more, you may feel a little bit more. You may have even experienced something in one's experience in one's life. But just be careful. I'm just going to bring before you what this would mean for us for this particular weekend. And uh, here it is. Just take the account of Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts is not going to go through the story he goes off to Newcastle Emlyn. He then goes up to Blaenanech. He has uh, the experience and uh, he has to come home. He wants to come home. And he asks the minister in his home church in Lacha, he says, could I just say a few words after the prayer meeting? In that meeting, 16 adults and one little girl stayed behind. Just going to put it to you. This is what he says. Uh, these are the four points that he gave and the four points which became known that he would impress upon the people. You want revival. You must obtain full and complete pardon for sins of the past. If the past is not corrected, it needs to be. Every sin must be confessed honestly before God. Those are four points. First one, you want God to move, you're going to have to deal with your past. Secondly, Anything doubtful in one's life needs to be removed, whether this is a habit or a trait or a doubtful aspect of character. For there can be no joy in one's heart when there's a questionable habits or pleasures exist. Self-denial is one of the very first essentials in the religion of Christ. 
Third, give complete obedience to the Holy Spirit whatever he asks of you. Bow down to him in prayer and resist him not. Fourthly and lastly, make a public uh, personal confession of Christ without delay. Stand up now and do not look to one another, but get it done. I'm just going to say to you, I know that there are no four points for any revival, but I do know this. Serious stuff. Serious stuff. You just want to hear the weekend of revival. It means business with God. Get things dealt with. Straighten out your life. Ask him to come in. Deal with him. Make confession. Do those things. I don't want another meeting. I just want us to know something of God. I know if it were four points, I'd make sure we'd all do them. But the reality is just get serious. Now, I know this is going to stand on people's toes, but here we are. I'm not going to waste the weekend. Here it is. If you're here in this meeting today and you have not been to your church prayer meeting this week, you're playing with fire. That's what you're doing. Playing with fire. If you've gone to your prayer meeting this week and you have not no problem at all <laughs> if you have been to your prayer meeting this week and not prayed in the situation we find ourselves for the Holy Spirit you've not opened your mouth you sat there week after week you're playing with fire you're playing with fire You've been to the prayer meeting. You've had your list which you've given. You say, and you've not prayed for the Holy Spirit. You're playing with fire. What on earth are we up to? And you say, hang on, I never came for this. I'm just going to show you that when revival does come, and these men of revival that you're going to hear about did not play with God. I'm going to read it to you. Evan Roberts is converted at the age of 13. He goes to a meeting where his uh, minister challenges them with these words. What if the Spirit comes to a service and you are not present? For the next 13 years, fair play to him, never missed, Evan attended regularly despite whatever the weather or conditions or difficulties, here's his itinerary. Prayer meeting, Monday evening. Prayer meeting, Tuesday evening, Pisca. Church meeting, Wednesday. Class meeting, Band of Hope. Thursday, another prayer meeting. And to his credit, never missed. You say, well, okay. You want a revival, you talk about it. R.A. Tory said, any revival without prayer is an utter sham. Think of this, I'm just saying, you want then God to move, and we're speaking of the great works he has done. Seth Joshua, who was in the meeting in Blainanech, who prayed that God would raise up someone, not from the intelligentsia, not from the religious community, but from the mines and from the field, that when Evan Roberts prayed for God to bend him, he said this, I prayed for four years, that prayer. Four years I prayed that God would raise a man, someone from experience to speak forth the things of God. I'm just showing you that we don't want to play with fire. Actually, there's something else, and look, time's going. I will get through this. you find it here. You can go to the book of Hosea, chapter 10 and verse 12. Now, I know that we don't like Charles Finney's idea of revival, but I will say to you, he does put his little finger upon something when he does say this, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, 
break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. And he does make a point, and please, if this is why you've come today and you want it in your life, well, you know what that's going to mean. It's not just that you will pray, but God will do something in your life and the conviction of sin will be experienced and confession will be made and repentance takes place and a change happens in our lives. That's what happens in revival. You have a zeal for God that you didn't have before and the things of God you're taken up with and do you really want it? You can have the Indian and think about it. And then you think about those very things. I, I'm just going to put my finger upon it. And uh, these books, they've been used greatly, greatly. They're, they're hard books to read, easy books. They're not books about revival. They're books that create a reviving within us of how God comes and calls us to the things of himself. Let me put another finger. I will close. I'm not just pointing the finger at you because when we speak of revival, I tell you what, ministers can be a real hindrance. You say, oh, how come? I tell you how. You try getting a minister to preach these days twice on a Sunday. Oh, it makes you mad. It makes you mad, I tell you. And you say, can you come and speak? Oh, well, you know, no. Well, you know, I'm... I'm well, no. Uh, look, can you come and speak for us? We're desperate for gospel speakers. We need speaking. To oh, I know, but you know, God's going to do a great work. Listen, how is God going to do a great work when people are not even prepared to preach a gospel? And you've got the gospel. But I can only do one on a Sunday these days. I'm just going to read it to you. Do you know what it says of Whitfield? John Piper wrote a book on Whitfield and said this. You can read it yourself. Jo George Whitfield preached more than he slept. Preached more than he slept. And when he was dying, trying to get to his bedroom, they asked him one more time to preach. He preached in the stairs and he never made it to his bedroom. And in those very words, he says, Oh, I'm not tired of the work. I'm tired in it. And he died died and preaching. Let me tell you something about this. I'm just going to give it to you. This is what it means. Ministers, it's a call. John Wesley, 40,000 sermons, 400 publications. I'm going to just quote you. Here it is from Bedditons. Here was the, the Methodist father. You love it. You're always talking the Methodist fathers. Oh, if we could have it back once again. Let me just read it to you for a moment. This is how it begins. This is the promises they made when they entered into that uh, ministry. And here, this is, this is how it goes. They expected, first of all, to die for their efforts. They swore to be, uh, in the preaching services, 5 a.m. They were demanding. Let's have a look. Yes, we will attend. At 5 o'clock in the morning, they were preaching. At 8, we will go to the prayer meeting. At 10, to the public worship at the foundry. 2 in the afternoon, we'll be preaching at the foundry. At 5, we will meet with the general society. At 6, the united bands. At 7, and again, be at the prayer meeting at 8, and then at home to read and pray ourselves. They had a fund called the Fund for the Burnt Out. Well, we're too frightened today to even get our ministers to have a flicker or even slightly be on the border of a burnt out experience. Evan Roberts was burnt out in 18 months. Praise God, he did a great work and he went through all the world and I do thank God for all that. I'm just saying, if you here today are waiting for the things of revival, it means prayer, it means serious work, it means a great zeal for the things of God. It doesn't mean that God then will do everything that we can go in our pleasurable ways, put out a deck chairs and watch it all happen. 
It means that God will raise his people, that you would be there and doing those things in a zealous and with a burning light. I'm going to close. Our time is gone. Just, I don't want to waste anybody's time uh, over the weekend. And uh, may this very meeting, this very weekend, be a stimulator once again to you and the Heath for, your, for the work which you've done in the years, really now, because this has been a great theme with you. I know it, and it's an important one, and it's one we need. You, you don't get depressed. Well, I'm not depressed. People may be depressed with the, with the things the way they are. No. He's given us work. To work for mission, for evangelism, and we do it all. But we don't forget revival. And God can come and do that. Look, I'm going to close. Couldn't you just close with these words and say, do it again, Lord. Do it again. Do it one more time, Lord. Do it once again. Amen. Amen. Amen.